Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, this seminar organised by uh, St Hilda's College. It's a series of seminars that we organise uh, addressing different aspects of, of drug discovery uh, and development. First into human studies represent a critical milestone in, in drug development, and it's really the first opportunity to assess the human potential of, of a potential new medicine. It's also the stage of development in which we are most dependent on preclinical or non-clinical data to inform decisions that we make as to the doses to be given and safety parameters for us that we should measure. Reliability of the data is vital to that drug development process and the protection of vol volunteers and patients in that process, which is our first priority. But there are multiple aspects uh, relating to reliability of data. And in this workshop, we're going to focus on one aspect in particular, the reproducibility of those um, data. I'm fortunate that we have been able to, we'll be able to hear from some real experts uh, in, in the field. So we're honoured to have Professor Tim Higginbottom, the President of the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Medicine, who will open with some remarks putting this important topic into context. Professor Higginbottom has enjoyed a distinguished career spanning the NHS, academia and pharmaceutical development, and so is ideally uh, placed to speak to us. Martin Emanuel Bittner is CEO, CEO and co-founder of Arcturus, the world's first fully automated drug discovery platform. Martin completed his medical degree in Germany and his DPhil in oncology as a Rhodes Scholar here in Oxford. He's worked in both clinical trials and drug discovery and is a member of a number of prestigious European uh, institutions and is actively involved in the open science movement. Professor Malcolm McLeod is Professor of Neurology and Translational Neuroscience at the University of Edinburgh, and his group has led the development and application of systemic re systematic review and meta-analysis in the analysis of data from animal studies modelling neurological diseases such as stroke. This work has allowed an overview of how effective drug is in animals and, in ident importantly, identification of the limits to the efficacy in animals, which might be relevant to human clinical trials. Prof. McLeod is also advises both the Home Office and the MHRA on aspects of uh, animal research. During today's seminar, we won't be taking questions after each talk, but we've set out to aside a good amount of time at the end of the panel for a Q&A session. Please type your questions into the live chat as they occur to you. We will pick those up and then put them to the speakers um, at the end. So thank you very much for your attention. And with further, without further ado, I'll professor, hand, hand on to Professor Higginbottom. Professor Higginbottom, thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Um, I'll start to share my slides, if I may. Well, um, thank you very much for inviting me to join this meeting. Um, my role, I think, is largely to sort of set the scene as to part of the um, exercise of training people to undertake first into human studies. And this will put a great deal of emphasis upon the importance of data in terms of deciding what is safe and what is not safe for the patients. Um, and I'd like to move on to the starting point of where the faculty became involved in First Interman very specifically. And it followed the Tegenero incident um, and the subsequent uh, report by Gordon Duff. Um, this is a, a really catastrophic event, but in medicine development, catastrophic events often shape and govern how we subsequently regulate the production of medicines at the various stages, and indeed they're used for later on. But this particular um, problem occurred as a result of a number of defects in how the study was run. And this led to an exercise of establishing a training program for people undertaking this work. And indeed, it led to a voluntary organization of all the commercial sites that were undertaking the work and uh, being assessed and um, qualified 
by the MRHA for this sort of work. Um, and that, I think, was a very important and quite different uh, state of affairs than many other countries. So in practical terms, there were one or two things that were learned about the uh, necessary input that is required from physicians in particular, but also scientists in terms of the development of these studies. Um, but the first frightening thing that came out of the report was the fact that there'd been a failure during the study of actually adequately recording medical data on the subjects who are taking part in the study. And in two of the patients, no medical history had been kept up to date. And that's actually extraordinarily important. Um, the actual contracting between the CRO and the sponsor hadn't been put into place. Two volunteers were allowed to leave the trial before it had been confirmed that they had received the placebo and not the active. Um, and in this, the study actually didn't have adequate insurance to cope with impacts of injury, whatever that may occur during the study. And then one of the doctors involved in the trial had not actually been adequately trained and there had been no 24 hour medical cover. Now, the reason I'm stressing all these things is that this is not just simply a question of disorganized approaches to it, but it, is a, it was a sign of systemic problems. And this has been replicated and continued to be replicated in countries indeed as late as uh, five years ago in France. So I think there is quite an important reiteration of our concerns in this part and to also to look at how to solve the problems. And I just go on to some of the recommendations. It was important to develop a national professional accreditation system for the first interhuman uh, clinician undertaking the work. And I think this is very strongly encouraged and indeed adopted by the MRHA. And the other is having postgraduate training programs that would enable people to undertake perhaps secondment um, in commercial organizations or training in specialist centers in the NHS or universities. And this is something that had gone into abeyance over the last eight years, and we tried to bring it back into our current training courses. So I'll move on now to just this other point. Beyond safety, it's extraordinarily important to do the first phase one and phase two studies extremely carefully. Uh, this is a relatively old piece of data, 2014, but it's done meticulously. And it was coming at a time when the number of phase three studies were failing. Um, and at that time, most of them were not failing for safety concerns, but it was for efficacy. And it highlights the importance of phase one and phase two in determining what can be an effective dose. And as you'll see here, um, looking at the failures for um, phase three and for those uh, studies which had MDAs and BLAs, they closed down predominantly up to, up to and just beyond 50% because of lack, lack of efficacy. Safety was not such a concern for phase three studies. And this is, I think, one of the great learnings. And it was very interesting um, three years ago, many pangolists at AstraZeneca, a company that was facing at that stage, probably the lowest success rate in phase three studies, particularly in oncology, we introduced the five dimension framework for R&D productivity. And you'll see in right safety, um, the very great importance of differentiation and clear safety margins with the product, understanding all the secondary pharmacology risk and understanding the reactive metabolites, genotoxicity, drug-drug interactions, and understanding the target liabilities. Probably the most important element here though, is identifying a link between the target and the disease. And I flag this because um, we, we are sort of dismissing in a way repurposing of old medicines, but using them in new disease. And during the COVID-19 exercise, 
there have been over 250 studies undertaken in repurposing medicines. Um, and we've only succeeded in getting two approved medicines from it. Um, and that has involved some 400,000 patients globally. And one particular product stands out because it was used in 30% of the studies um, and involved uh, just under 30% of the total patient numbers. And that was hydroxychloroquine. And the importance of this is that the whole pathology of the product was not appropriate for treating an acute illness as it takes up to five days to a week to get the optimal distribution of the drug within the tissues involved. And there was another small detail, and this comes down to the data, and that was that the um, IC25, which was far too low as a, a sort of criteria for uh, preventing viral replication, that was not achievable within that five-day interval in lung tissue. So I think there are things like this that are, if you like, particularly important and looking at beyond first into man, but in repurposing first into disease. So very quickly, our program, it's a two-year program, although you can have it reduced to 18 months. There are three training courses, exploratory drug development, uh, de drug development pharmacology and management of emergencies in human pharmacology. And all people have to do an ALS system of training. We have examinations and we have a portfolio of work which is now being transformed into an electronic online um, portfolio. And what we've initiated basically is a standardized way of contracting uh, sites to do the training. They're contracted as uh, local education providers. And we do have a, a new e-portfolio system that is being um, uh, applied. And on a six monthly interval, people would have an external review of competency progression. And this is standardized really for all specialists in terms of higher medical training. And finally, uh, the extended examinations to provide an uh, understanding of the knowledge base, again, are being critically reviewed and altered in terms of uh, providing it online and offering what I describe as a broader area of retraining and people who have failures in passing the exam. And we're looking towards GMC accreditation for this training. So other considerations, um, recognition of prior training, this particularly for uh, those that are generic uh, capabilities that are required. We're looking at setting up sabbatical training across specialist units and acting as a clearinghouse for that. Introducing modules for AMP, AMTPs and vaccines working with the RCP and BPS within the NIHR initiative for online training for people who are uh, um, clinically qualified and specialists. And then finally, um, setting up ways of looking at uh, relevant repurposing of uh, established medicines for treatment of new disease and setting out a code of practice for that. So with that, I'll pause, but I just, would like to share one final thought, and that is, it is extraordinarily difficult to, to get a medicine medical device approved. It's only probably between one in 10 and 20% that actually ever get approved. It costs an enormous amount of money and involves an enormous number of volunteer patients to be involved. So, Taking the first step into man is probably the most important part of this process. So thank you for listening and happy to answer some questions later. Duncan. Thank you very much, um, Tim. And um, I, I'm, I'm going to develop some of those ideas. You very nicely laid out the, the context here of how we 
it, how critical this stage is and the importance of training uh, those that are medically responsible for this. And I'm going to develop some of those ideas now uh, around the particular role of, um, uh, of, um, of, of data reproducibility in, uh, in, uh, in keeping uh, patients um, safe. As has been mentioned, um, th there is a particular context around first, first into humans. We've mentioned its key role in, in inflection point in, in development. But remember that the volunteers in phase one studies really were cannot expect to derive any um, meaningful cl clinical or therapeutic benefit and therefore safety is absolutely paramount and I'll be focusing on that um, in, in, in my talk. But this really is the opportunity to establish whether you really do have something that is a potential new medicine or whether this was a good idea that is not going to go um, anywhere. The two big disasters have been uh, uh, already alluded to in, in uh, Tim's, um, uh, uh, Tim's talk, and he, he mentioned a number of the, the policy changes that uh, arose um, out of those um, two, two disasters. But I want to pick out some particular points around the data um, and the information that underlay that. In the example of, of Tegenero, it was clear that um, the information used to calculate the starting dose um, underestimated the uh, efficacy of this um, uh, of this um, uh, molecule to a, a very dramatic degree, and essentially um, the dose that they were beginning with um, was going to achieve not the very low levels of receptor occupancy that they thought they would get, get but actually achieve nearly 100% receptor occupancy. And when you have something that is what is described as a super agonist, essentially it is something, uh, a, a, a drug that acts through the pathway with all the breaks taken off, um, what you get is a multiplicative effect. And, and that's how this led to a dramatic um, uh, effect in terms of the, uh, the the patients with this what's called cytokine storm, where a lot of these uh, um, uh, signaling molecules were released in very large quantities and made the the subjects extremely unwell and require uh, in intensive care. And importantly. Um, those calculations were flawed, but also the data underlying it was not uh, reproducibly um, looked at in different formats in order to look at whether um, you were getting a consistent effect. They took one set of data and used that and, and drove that through the process. And the other one was the bile disaster, this time in, in Rennes in France. And, and crucially in this case, what was clear was that the underlying pharmacology suggested that this molecule was not as selective a, a, a molecule uh, as uh, it was uh, purported to be in the investigator's brochure, but had quite a lot of other effects. But also importantly, the doses that they were driving to were not based upon an assessment of the pharmacology and the doses that ultimately proved to be toxic and actually uh, resulted in, in a death of, of, um, of one subject um, actually um, were a hundredfold higher than were needed to engage the primary pharmacology. So again, there's a fundamental flaw in the underlying data. And again, it was the use of single um, pieces of information to inform the, uh, the decisions about dose. And in both cases, uh, these had tragic uh, consequences. So as someone who has run quite a lot of um, uh, first into human um, uh, studies, I, I have a framework that I that I use when I'm thinking about um, uh, how we think about the risks associated with that. So one needs to think about what the on-target pharmacology is. So what does this 
um, uh, what does this molecule actually do? And crucially, where does it do it as well? Because sometimes uh, people focus excessively on the pharmacology in one particular tissue and forget that it's uh, actually expressed in lots of other tissues. And uh, the drug doesn't know that it's only supposed to be acting in the heart uh, and will, will have its effect throughout the body. But the on-target pharmacology is usually relatively well um, described. But again, um, if I think about the brochures and the information that I have looked at over the years, in many cases, the reproducibility of that um, data was not explicitly discussed in, in, in the brochure. Um, I certainly one would expect the experiment to have been done more than once, but uh, I can't always recall uh, that the reproducibility of that um, was explicitly discussed. Clearly, off-target pharmacology is very important. How selective is your molecule for the, for the thing that you're interested in? And clearly, this is an important source of, uh, of potential toxicity. It's worth saying that the most of the primary screens for these types of things are based on a single experiment. Um, and so, again, our assessment of risk here will be based upon a very rudimentary screening type uh, investigation and based often on a, a single um, assessment. Safety pharmacology are the kind of in vivo studies that one conducts, particularly to look at respiratory risk, cardiovascular risk or, or CNS um, risk. And I won't go into those in detail because Malcolm uh, will later on be describing uh, his views on, uh, on the use of, uh, of animal studies. Clearly, toxicology is vitally important. We need to know um, some of this will be driven by on-target effects, some of it by uh, off-target um, effects. But it's also worth saying that um, often the number of animals involved in early phase studies is quite small. And one really does have to pay attention, not just to the mean um, exposure achieved at that particular dose level, but what the variability around that is. And importantly, um, very often we see it, as a result of these relatively small experiments, that variability can be quite large. And one needs to take that into account uh, when thinking about uh, humans. What is the variability of exposure that you might expect in a human? And how does that map onto the variability of exposure that you saw in the preclinical um, animal species? Because you might have a human has a particularly high um, exposure, um, but also some people may be more susceptible and therefore um, the, the margins uh, may overlap more than you, more than you think. Drug interactions are often in first into humans uh, studies dodged by the fact that we try to um, avoid people who are taking um, other things. But these become increasingly important as one goes through the development process. And indeed, in a world where um, most patients are taking multiple medicines, they become very important. But importantly, um, our assessment of these um, uh, these uh, risks are often based on a relatively small number of in vitro investigations. And again, um, I, I can't recall from my uh, reading that the variability or reproducibility of those findings uh, is ever discussed in, uh, in investigators' brochures. We then finally need to think about the patient population that we're proposing to teach treat either in our first into human study or uh, later in, in into um, development. And this is somewhat less dependent on preclinical um, data. But as I think we've seen, it's about at this stage, it's about the only aspect of the uh, of the safety framework that is not critically dependent on the preclinical data. And therefore, its reproducibility and reliability is absolutely critical. We've talked a, a fair bit about dose because dose is the thing that uh, those of us who are involved in these things are particularly um, focused on. And we've identified that using a single method to um, identify this is, is probably not ideal. The original 
um, way of assessing dose was to simply take the fraction of the administered dose in, in an animal species and convert that into, into a human. Um, you can imagine that that is a, a pretty blunt instrument because it fails to uh, take into account differences in exposure, i.e. the way that the drug is metabolized and, and, uh, uh, and dealt with by uh, animal species and human species. So it is generally considered a pretty unreliable uh, method these days. What we do re regularly do and routinely do is look at the exposure in the, um, the animal species um, with regard to the effect level and then uh, attempt to uh, identify a margin from that and, and use that in, in human studies. And the currently most favoured um, method is to take that one stage further and really think in terms of what the minimal anticipated biological effect of the molecule is. Whilst that is uh, attractive, because what you're really saying is, how does the drug work and how do I have effective uh, levels of safeties uh, based upon the, the actual mechanism of action uh, of the drug and the concentrations at which that occur? You'll appreciate that, of course, your ability to do that is critically dependent upon the data that you use um, uh, around uh, the pharmacology and, and therefore high variability or a low level of reproducibility in those data is going to have a very big effect on the uh, dose that um, you uh, should take into account. Um, and very often uh, these will involve uh, complex PKPD models. And, and I'll, I'll say a word or two on that um, in the, at the moment. It's worth saying, and this was a, a key learning from the bile uh, disaster, was that your top dose should really take into account the pharmacology, not just toxicology um, safe, safe margins. Because frankly, once you've achieved um, your maximal pharmacology, the only thing that you can do by going uh, beyond that is potentially cause harm. So here are some data taken from um, Nicole Zitzman's lab, um, which illustrate to me the, the issue that we have um, around um, data that we might use to, um, uh, to calculate a dose for um, a, a human study. And this is Camastat, which is actually a, an established uh, drug. It's used quite widely um, in um, in Japan, um, but it was being repurposed in this case for, for COVID-19. Uh, and what these data helpfully uh, summarize is you've got a whole range of different um, uh, cell types here. Um, you've got um, multiple different um, assay types that have been used. And indeed, you get multiple different, very widely ranging estimates of the EC50. And so, um, this puts you in quite a difficult situation when trying to assess what dose you might use of this drug um, to go forward. So the reproducibility here, even uh, it is not discussed around those individual assays, but once you look, begin to look uh, between assays, uh, then that reproducibility is just not there. Um, and that puts you in, in a difficult position. I have mentioned that PKPD models are critical to this process, but I think for many clinicians, uh, PKPD models are seen as something of a black box illustrated there on, on the left-hand side, and they don't spend a great deal of time interrogating um, what lies between them. But if you think about it, any PKPD model is much like a, a complex watch um, uh, mechanism is a series of different mathematical equations, usually differential equations, which map out what might happen. But each of those is critically dependent on the quality of the data that go uh, into that in the same way that if you took out uh, any one of those little cogs or if one of those uh, little cogs was manufactured uh, considerably less well than any of the others, then regardless of how well the rest of the thing is put together, um, you will end up with a result that is unreliable. And in, when it comes to the first into human patient, um, studies, that puts patients at risk. And my final example that I wanted to um, highlight is that this is very real in, in, in 
um, in terms of um, uh, clinical decision making. And I just wanted to give you one example here. So the PD-1 um, drugs um, are some of the uh, most widely used uh, anti-cancer drugs uh, in the world. And, and, and several of these are, are blockbuster um, drugs. Um, but you need a way to understand whether your patient's cancer um, particularly has expression of this um, target and therefore whether the drug is going to be um, useful. The challenge is there are a number of different assays available, um, each of them linked to a particular product, um, which are available, uh, are available to um, uh, help you make um, that decision. And in this very helpful paper, they looked at um, uh, th those in terms of uh, a particular kind of uh, uh, lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, and found that actually um, the results that you got when you ran these different tumors against um, these assays gave you very, very different results. And importantly, in over a third of the cases, you would have got a different uh, classification. And an important minority of these cases, actually, you would have made a different decision about whether you should treat this patient or not. So I hope that helps to illustrate how those of us who are working in the clinical field are absolutely dependent on the quality of uh, the data that underlies that uh, clinical decision making. And this is particularly uh, acute in the um, um, in, in the first into human um, stage. And so now we're going to hear from uh, a couple of experts uh, in, these, um, uh, in these areas. Martin Emanuel Bittner was particularly uh, around many of the vital preclinical assays that underlie our decision making. And then Malcolm will speak uh, about uh, animal studies. So um, Martin, over to you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to bring up my slides. This should be visible in full screen. Wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the very kind, very kind introduction and for the invitation. I'm delighted to speak about what I think is really the foundation for everything we're going to speak about during the rest, rest of the event, which is data quality and data stewardship in the discovery stage as one way to make sure that what we then move into clinical trials has a very solid foundation and a solid grounding. It is indeed robust, reliable, and reproducible. First of all, the reason why we're here is that we do need new and better therapies. The latest numbers are roughly one in two people will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime, one in three with dementia, and one in 17 with one of the many rare diseases. In other words, it really is an environment where we do need new therapies, better therapies, and we can develop faster. Right now, the drug discovery process that we're all very familiar with takes on average, anything between 10 and 15 years and costs in excess of 2 billion US dollars just to bring one new drug successfully from the target idea, target hypothesis stage up until phase three and then kind of launch in the, in the clinical setting. In other words, it's a very long process. It's a very expensive process and it's a process where the chance of success is very low. Indeed, if we look at the productivity in the R&D, kind of the pharmaceutical and pharmaceuticals industry, R&D productivity over the past few years and decades, what we can see is that the productivity has been in decline for quite a long time by now. Productivity here is defined as the number of drugs being approved per research billion dollars spent. And there's of course kind of various events that influence that curve, for example, certain kind of changes in regulation, for example, certain changes in new technologies, 
move to those target therapies. But what we see is that the overall trends points downwards. And that is extremely worrying because at some point we're going to reach the stage where developing a new drug is no longer sustainable. And given enough the huge amount of funding required to bring a new drug to market, we know that this is something that goes beyond the budget of research councils and charities, but it does require contributions from industry to develop those drugs. And that is the reason why I think we need to be very mindful of this trend, we need to find ways to reverse it, because at the moment, this is pointing towards an unsustainable situation. If we try to find out what are the reasons for this decline in productivity and for the very low level of productivity as of now, there are a few areas that really stand out. One of them is data quality. I'm going to look into this kind of in a bit more depth over the next kind of one or two slides, but we know there is a serious lack of reproducibility and of lack of data quality in research. At the same time, we know that a lot of data is very poorly annotated and oftentimes unstructured. At the same time, laboratory operations today very much look the same way they looked 20, 30, 50, or even 100 years ago. Mostly manual with data generation being, being conducted kind of over many, many hours every day with scientists having very little time to spend on higher value tasks, such as thinking, hypothesizing, reading, putting research into context. All of these things are currently not receiving the same amount of time and attention they deserve. And this is the third point in that we use our most valuable resource very inefficiently. Because our scientists waste too much time either with manual lab work or with trying to interpret results that are very ambiguous. And a lot of that has to do with how these experiments are being conducted and how data is being captured. One of the very scary findings that came out of the past few years is how widespread the lack of reproducibility is. There were two, two papers in particular, one in Nature Review Structure Discovery and one in Nature, um, as well as another one in PLOS One, where researchers, primarily from industry, published how many peer-reviewed research findings they actually succeeded in reproducing. And what they published is that in 80 to 90% of cases, they were not able to fully reproduce peer-reviewed published findings from high-quality journals. So we're talking about a massive amount of research that even when contacting the authors and even when using all the resources available to pharma, they were not able to confirm as being robust and reliable. And at the same time, we know that around 50%, one in two cell lines used in laboratories worldwide are either contaminated or misidentified. I mean, the classic example is kind of people in this lab often say, in the end, everything is HeLa, because we know that HeLa cells are extremely robust and they grow very quickly. And so we know that many cultures out there, which we think are many different types of cell lines, are in fact contaminated or have been replaced by HeLa. So, in other words, in many cases, the research being published is not a good source to start a drug discovery program because too much of it is not robust and not reliable enough. And that is something we need to take out of very serious because this has direct implications for the clinical phase of development. I'm just going to show kind of the title of this paper which came out two years ago in Science Translational Medicine, which showed that for many cancer drugs already in clinical trials, the mechanism of action was actually off-target toxicity. It was a very elegant study where in this case, they took a number of compounds in clinical trials that were hypothesized to act via a certain target. And they removed the target using CRISPR and found that it had zero effects on the drug's impact on cells. In other words, kind of the cells had an effect on, in this case, kind of on cancer cells, but it was not via the target they've been developed for. And that is slightly worrying when you think about compounds undergoing clinical trials, which for years have gone through preclinical drug discovery, the discovery stage and preclinical pre studies, under the very firm assumption 
that those drugs would indeed target, for example, KRAS, and turns out they don't act by KRAS at all. So that is something that really shows us that on the way from the lab to the clinic, we need to think about data quality, reliability, and reproducibility very, very carefully. One extremely important concept that has been emerging over the past few years is the concept of metadata. Metadata is something that I'm going to go into more detail on in the next few slides. Metadata is a term that refers to all the information that surrounds a certain data record. In order to be robust, in order to be reproducible, we first need to be able to capture what has actually been done. In other words, experimental information needs to be structured and fully annotated. In too many cases, are we dealing with, for example, a research group where one researcher uses a certain form of nomenclature and different postdocs in the same group uses a different form of nomenclature. And when one postdoc leaves the group, there is no way of knowing who actually did what, is it the same protein, is it a different protein, et cetera. So we need to think about capturing information in a structured way, in a fully annotated way. Another example that can be used here is how, how reliable are scientific protocols? Normally researchers work with a protocol that might, for example, contain an instruction saying, mix the sample. However, if we think about it carefully, mix the sample is not a very well-defined term. It could be shaking, could be stirring, could be vortexing, could be for 30 seconds, maybe for three minutes, maybe at room temperature, maybe on ice. No one really knows. And every researcher will interpret the same protocol slightly differently. And these slight differences, when compounded, lead to variations and deviations in experimental outcomes. One way of going about that is capturing more precisely what actually happens. And one very interesting way of looking at this is, how can we make sure this information is accessible afterwards? And we started with lab books, normally kind of written by hand, accessible to humans, but oftentimes only the researcher who can read their own handwriting. And we've then been moving into spreadsheets, tables, maybe electronic lab notebooks, which is something which at least kind of in some ways can also be read by a machine. And finally, we're moving into kind of the next stage of development, which is using RDF statements as one way of capturing information in a machine accessible form. So that, for example, kind of platforms and machine learning algorithms, as well as other kind of other software can actually read information, understand the information, and can try kind of to draw conclusions based on different pieces of work. What it basically means is that where we want to go is we want to look kind of at what currently is below the waterline. At the moment, current data generation, current data processing is oftentimes not reproducible. Region cell and provenance is often unclear. Methods and protocols are being used inconsistently. There is human error and variability, for example, in packeting accuracy. And we often only look at a very limited number of data points per essay. On the other hand, below the waterline, the rest of the iceberg, this would be kind of what data generation and data processing would look like ideally, where we adhere to protocols. They can be automated and uh, as well, but where we adhere to these protocols, where we know where the regions come from, we know where the cell lines come from, we have full information on the cell line identity. We perform regular tests on, for example, contamination status. At the same time, results data being kept in a structured and standardized form, ideally in all common file formats that are then used, for example, by repositories. At the same time, we want to capture the metadata I was referring to before, because we do want to know how an experiment is being conducted, under which conditions, which temperature, which humidity, exact timings. Another nice example is protocols talking about an overnight incubation. Depending how good your sleep is, an overnight incubation could be anything between seven hours and 14 hours. So in other words, you really need to think very carefully about capturing information in a far more detailed fashion. 
This is an example I brought from, from our work where we looked at just one type of assay that is very commonly being used in research. In this case, an IC50 biochemical assay where we, where we look at an inhibitor that inhibits a certain target. And we can see that conventionally, we only look at a, at a handful of different data points and we use interpolation in between, where in, an, in a more complete sense, what we'd actually like to do is have and test far more data points while at the same time also capturing more information, for example, laboratory conditions, for example, again, um, region origin, exact timings, quality control parameters, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just an example to illustrate how we could move from an essay that only has kind of the, the bare necessities of information to something which is in depth, which is rich, which contains kind of all of the appropriate information surrounding the actual experiment that allows us to have greater confidence in the findings and greater confidence in the results being obtained by these experiments. One way of, of thinking about it is, is how do we actually capture this information on an, on an IT level? And this is gonna just a very brief, brief kind of look into kind of one way of doing these things where reproducibility and reusability of experiments is something which as of now in the scientific community has not received that much attention, but this is something which is changing more and more since the fair data principles findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, are having more and more of an impact on the research ecosystem. And in this case, kind of one way kind of which, which we've basically tried and tested is to make sure that experiments of a certain type always run the same way, making sure that optimizations are applied before a set of experiments. So there's no optimization throughout an experiment, but instead there's an optimization, then there is a run, and you know exactly which conditions were being applied and making sure that control experiments are being conducted in very regular intervals. So these are kind of very much industry best practices that we believe need to be applied to research more broadly to make sure that experiments are actually as reproducible and reusable as they should be and could be. I briefly mentioned FAIR data, kind of FAIR being kind of the new standards in how data is being, being seen. And one very important, very important basic form of understanding here is what does it actually mean? And what does that mean on the, on the individual data sets level? So the starting point is always kind of the inner core, a digital object, which in this case could be kind of an experiment, whether it's data, a piece of code, some form of research output which needs to be given in a standard format and needs to come with persistent identifiers, metadata and full documentation. So this is kind of very much one of the core of every, every piece of data in the scientific sense. The identifiers that come with this piece of information is something which allows this object to be anchored to something. So we know, for example, this data set can be found, it can be retrieved in a reliable form. As of now, it is practically impossible to link back to a certain data sets. Even with published papers, trying to track down the raw data is often impossible. Contacting the corresponding author, you might be lucky, you might not. Data might be in a repository, it might not. The poster who did the, did the experiments might still be in research, he or she might not. So those are things where we really need to think about how do we store data in a way that it is accessible in a persistent way and that it can't be confused with other data. So that's about the identification of data sets. The next question is standards. Ideally, all of the objects, the digital objects kind of the, the contents of research should be given in file formats that are actually accessible to others, and where we use a small set of standards data formats that can actually be used, as opposed to having three dozen different data formats. So it's extremely important to make sure that data is captured in file formats that are and that remain accessible. 
It's a bit like the example kind of with, with for example, different mediums being used, where currently having information on a VHS tape is quite difficult because there's hardly any VHS players still left out there. And at some point it will be extremely difficult to retrieve any information stored on these more legacy pieces of, uh, of data capture. In other words, what we need to make sure is that whichever way we store information in, we can actually access it and other people can access it too. And the final point kind of the metadata I was referring to before, this is very much the context which surrounds all of our experiments, where we know the more metadata we have, the better, because then we know how an object was created, when it was created, by whom it was created, for which purpose, etc. So this onion model really shows very clearly, I think, how we're moving from one digital object at the core to something which is then persistent and uniquely identified, documented in an open and accessible form and contextualized in a way that is also of use to other researchers. And this is something which especially funding bodies also getting more and more interested in because funding bodies realize that if they fund research in one research group, ideally they would like the same data to be able to be reused by another research group so they can draw additional conclusions from it. Because in the end, we all work together towards generating new knowledge and ideally finding new treatments. So instead of having all of these small data silos, what we would like to see is that data is being shared openly and can be used, for example, for machine learning applications, where the more data there is, the easier it is to draw conclusions and to make, uh, make certain you know, inferences on what might be a promising drug target or a promising approach for a new therapeutic, um, therapeutic agent. This is just kind of a brief look, basically going back kind of to how this actually sits within the ecosystem. So I've already briefly mentioned kind of the funding bodies, academic centers kind of the left-hand corner. Of course, there's Biotech, there's Pharma, but there's also a very important role being played by the FDA. And basically as an example for regulatory bodies, as well as industry associations. Because we always need to think about, so who can actually help us make research more reproducible and who in this ecosystem can also drive that change. Because as we've seen before, it is a very serious situation that we're in at the moment. The reproducibility is very limited and where we use drugs in clinical trials with information from the earlier stages, from discovery and from preclinical is obviously not sufficient to really kind of move these drugs into clinical trials confidently. So we need to think very carefully where in this triangle we can see potential avenues to work on that. And I can now disclose that we're, for example, in con conversations with regulators and also as part of my, part of my academic work, I'm also gonna be in very close collaboration with working groups that, for example, are involved in, in UNESCO statements on open science, because we need to think very carefully about what, is, what, is, what are the, the governing principles for making research as reproducible, as robust, and as open as we can. And towards the end, I would like to share kind of one or two examples for organizations that are active in this space. One of them is the Allotrope Foundation. So in this case, it is a consortium of companies, pharmaceutical, um, biopharmaceutical, um, also some equipment suppliers and other companies that work together because they think that what we need is standardized data formats for analytical data. So that's basically that's their, their kind of the fo main focus of the Electro Foundation lies in analytical data. But the reason why I picked this is because it shows how a broad coalition of different partners comes together because they've recognized that what we need to do kind of on the data side needs to come from, needs to come from collaborative efforts it is most likely not going to be a single entity proposing this, but rather kind of a group of people coming together who realize the shortcomings and who have the desire to work on this. In some ways, complementary kind of to the Electro Foundation is the Pistoia Alliance that some people might also be, be familiar with, which is 
the kind of an organization that has been around for the past roughly you know, 10, 10, 12 years, started by, again, large pharma companies, but also, also kind of bringing on board several other entities such as ASCO and ADCC. And they basically want to work together on looking at what are the most important obstacles to innovation. Obstacles such as data formats being very different or obstacles such as no standards being in existence. So what we can see is that there are organizations that already work towards creating these standards and it will just be a matter of time before these standards are going to be rolled out more broadly. And I think that these efforts are quite important in helping us to bring greater degrees of reproducibility based on data structure into the research environment. So briefly enough summarizing, so I believe kind of that's part of the future will be based on greater degrees of experimental consistency, greater degrees of expert guidance from industry, from academia. Of course, our position is that automation will play a very important role in this. But at the same time, we can also see that capturing more information, capturing more data, and making sure that data is being protected and made accessible at the same time is going to be critical as we move forward. So with that, I would like to end and thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to the other talks and to the conversation later on. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. And uh, our final speaker is, uh, is Malcolm McLeod, and uh, then we'll have uh, some time for some questions. We have had some questions uh, come in, but uh, please type those into the chat and then we will uh, triage them uh, for, the, for the panel discussion afterwards. Um, Malcolm, thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, my background is as a neurologist, and I've spent a lot of my time trying to think about how we can develop uh, treatments for neurological disease, and usually that brings you back at some point to an animal model, but not always at animal models. So I'm going to talk about animal models, among other things. If I can get my mouse somewhere where I can get my slide advanced. So, uh, First of all, my conflicts of interest, which will uh, uh, have a bearing on, on what I think. Uh, I'm the academic coordinator of an innovative medicines initiative called the European Quality and Preclinical Data, which is developing a quality framework for academic and pharma and SME labs uh, to be able to ensure some of the things which you've just, uh, which you've just been hearing about in terms of, of how research is done. I'm a member of the Commission for Human Medicines and Chair of their Neurology, Pain and Psychiatry Expert Advisory Groups, previously sat on the Home Office Animals and Science Committee regulating animal research in the UK. And I'm Academic Lead uh, for Research Improvement and Research Integrity at the University of Edinburgh, which may be relevant uh, for some of my later slides. So I, I, Oxford, uh, I think everyone that speaks English is a first language in Oxford, but in, in the Celtic fringes, Wales and Scotland and Ireland, we have these bilingual road signs in case there's some truck drivers, presumably, who don't understand English and need to have the same thing recapitulated in, a, in their own language. So here's one, no entry for, for heavy goods vehicles, residential site only, and underneath it says the same thing in Welsh, except it doesn't. Uh, what it says in Welsh is, I am not in the office at the moment, send any work to be translated. So this translational road signist, if you like, hasn't understood the data management protocol uh, that their system was using. And in some ways, what we do as translational neuroscientists is blighted by the same problems, uh, that we don't really understand what our experimental systems, what our models are actually, are actually telling us. And uh, you've heard mention earlier on of the Begley paper and the Prince paper and the problem with reproducibility in the life sciences in general. And I, I, in all of this, I'm reminded of, of, of the old light bulb jokes that were going around 20 or 30 years ago. How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb, for instance? Well, only one, but the light bulb uh, really has to want to change. Uh, how many crises does it take to change research practice is my current version, only one but research really has to want to change. And, and part of the issue here, I, I think, is that there's a lot invested by people who command uh, 
to the strategic heights of our research ecosystem who are perhaps not as invested in change as they might be. So change is slow and painful. If we think about research quality and what academic excellence means, I, I envisage this as a, as a three-legged stool. Uh, one leg is inspiration. It's having that genius, insightful moment to realize that the level of water in the bath has gone up because you've displaced it, or that drug X might be a good drug to, to think in drug Y. And as an institution, you can't really hire on that basis because Nobel Prizes are few and far between. Uh, and so you've just got to hope that inspiration comes. But other aspects of, of research practice, I think, are more readily open to evaluation. The first around project design. Are people using research designs which are at low risk of bias? Are they managing their data properly? Have they got appropriate ethical reflection on what they're doing and why and what the balance is between the potential harms to research participants and the potential benefits and how you might maximize those benefits? And pre-registration of study designs, of which a little more later. And in, in the execution of the experimental work itself, transparency and reporting, appropriate analysis, making appropriate and well-founded evidentiary claims, making your study materials available and disseminating your research in a way that allows everyone to benefit from it rather than only a few. Uh, the patients that I've recruited into clinical trials in the past did so, I think, on the basis that, that the findings would be available to everyone who was interested, not just those who had a subscription to a medical journal in which they were carried. Now, I want to say a little bit about the importance of heterogeneity uh, just to, to get it out of the way. This is work from Eski Tan River Ida, who's recently finished with us as a PhD student and is now with AstraZeneca as a statistician. And we were interested in heterogeneity in the animal literature. The old story used to be that you, you had to iron out the differences between test and control, try and get rid of everything that was variable, and then you would be left with a pureness of the biology. And the problem with that approach is it gives you a very pure estimate of what's happening in your setup, in your lab, in your laboratory on a Thursday afternoon, but it doesn't necessarily tell you anything very generalizable about the findings. So here's when we look at the accumulating data for a drug called tissue plasminogen activator, a clot busting treatment used in stroke. This is the heterogeneity increasing as time goes on. This is the uh, variance in the overall estimate of how much uh, good TPA does. And you can see that very quickly, within about 10 or 20 experiments, you've got a fairly robust and reproducible evaluation of the effect of TPA. But if we look at tau squared, which is the variability between studies, that shows a different pattern. To start off with, there's a big spike in heterogeneity, presumably as lots and lots of labs are trying to see whether they can get the effect at all. And then for the next 100 experiments or so, the community is learning how to do the experiment and get the right answer. And then there's a second increase in tau squared. And we think this is when people say, well, maybe this drug works in young animals. Does it work in old animals? Does it work in diabetic animals or those with hypertension? And then you get a fall off in heterogeneity again. Uh, and we think that actually the optimum point for thinking about moving into humans is when you've reached this second peak of heterogeneity. And with Shinichi and Nakagawa and others, we recently published this work in PLOS Biology that looks at the impact of heterogeneity and the estimate of the effectiveness of drugs for stroke in animal models. And to explain this, this line here is the line of no effect. Each crosshair is a drug. Drugs which are out here don't do anything, so the gray drugs are, are null in their effect. Going up and down here, is the heterogeneity between individual experiments in, in what the drug does. And so you can see some here where the drug works under every circumstance. This is TPA thrombolytics here. That's not far off this. This is, the, uh, this is the measure of heterogeneity here. And hypothermia is the most effective drug by a mile, but sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And we think that may be a barrier uh, to the exploitation of hypothermia in the treatment of stroke. And in fact, I've been involved in clinical trials uh, of hypothermia in the treatment of stroke that haven't, that haven't been successful for, for other reasons. So that's heterogeneity. And this is Robert Rosenthal. He's not been one of my PhD students, unfortunately. He's recently retired at the age of 86 after a long, long career in, uh, in statistics and methodology and psychology. And in 1963, he published this study 
he was teaching a course in psychology to graduate students. And at the end of the course, they had to do an experiment. And their experiment was pretty straightforward. That they were comparing cognitive performance in, in two cohorts of animals, one which had been bred and selected for at Berkeley, which at that time had been a big center for cognition research, to perform well in cognitive tasks like this, but they were naive to this particular task. And the other group was their slightly duller, dumber, bred and presumably inbred country cousins who performed poorly in such tasks. And the rat was put into the stem of a tea maze and one arm was lit and one wasn't and which was lit and which wasn't was flipped according to a predetermined random schedule. And this unlit arm was always reinforced with a food reward. So the rat, rather like our early career researchers, was being trained to turn to the dark side and this is what he found on the first day of the experiment. The maze bright animals performed better than the maze dull animals. And over the five days of the experiment, both cohorts of animals improved in their performance. But that improvement was much more substantial in the maze bright animals. And when he asked the, the students what they thought of their animals, these animals were maze bright. Uh, they, they were lovely cheery animals uh, with uh, happy demeanors and uh, lovely wet noses, the sort of rats that you'd like to take home to meet your mum and dad. And the maize dull animals were surly and insolent. And in fact, three of the students were bitten by their maize dull animals. And in fact, of course, he's a smart guy. The experiment he'd done wasn't on the rats at all because they'd been selected at random from the same cages in the same animal house on the first day of the experiment. The only difference between them in their cognitive performance and also pr presumably in their in their biting behavior was in the expectations that the experimenters had and how those ex uh, how those expectations transferred to the animal behaviors as observed in these outcomes so we've known this from 1963 which was even before i was born there was a, a drug called nh 59 developed as a stroke drug by astrazeneca to uh, uh, patient clinical trial program involving over five and a half thousand patients and everyone expected the drug to work uh, and uh, when the Saint 2 trial came out it was neutral and I was sitting in Jim McCulloch who's an old Edinburgh uh, stroke researcher I was sitting in his office at the time and we thought that's a surprise and it didn't just surprise us it surprised the market their share price fell by 17 percent over the next 48 hours equivalent to the gross domestic product of Barbados at the time, and it took seven years to recover. And Jim said, well, I wonder what the animal's data were really like. And I said, well, I've got a tool to do this where we look at the animal data in systematic review. So this gray bar here is the overall estimate of how good NXY is in 29 experiments involving 408 animals. Now, to me, it's a bit uh, uh, interesting that you think you need 5,000 human animals to show efficacy, but you can invest millions in a clinical trial on the basis of one tenth of that. But here, what we're doing is dividing the, the, the reports into those that did or did not report randomly allocating the animals to group, that did or did not report blinding during the experiment or blinding in the assessment of outcome. And what you can see is that the efficacy is substantially and significantly lower in those studies which are at higher, uh, which are at low risk of bias. And in fact, not one of these uh, publications did all three of these things. And the two that were used by Astra to, pers to persuade doctors like me to put patients into their clinical trial had actually done none of these things. So with the benefit of hindsight, and I take that, with the benefit of hindsight, um, it's easy to see, <clears throat> excuse me, why NHMI uh, fell over in clinical trial. So partly as a result of work from our group and from others, uh, Story Landis and Shai Silberberg convened a meeting at the NIH in 2012 that tried to set up some minimum reporting standards for animal experiments and rather go the whole Monty. They said, what are the, what are the four most important things you want to see? And the meeting came out with the view that we wanted to know about randomization. We wanted to know about blinding. We wanted to know about animals excluded from the final analysis and why. And we wanted to know that they'd done an a priori power calculation. So having done this work with stroke, we were told that by the community, by the people who don't want change, that everyone knows that stroke doctors are, uh, are, are not very good. Stroke researchers aren't very good. If they were good, they'd have effective treatments like the cancer doctors and the HIV doctors and the immunologists. And we thought that was an interesting hypothesis that we could test. And around about that time, uh, there'd been a bit of chat about the results of the research assessment exercise 2008, which had said that they were particularly impressed by an 
an outstanding contribution to how good we were in the UK, rah, 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 rah sort of prefiguring our current political leadership by at least 15 years, uh, impressed by the strengths within the basic neurosciences in particular, and that didn't really make sense to me. So what we did was we went to the research assessment exercise and to those units of assessment that used animal research, that reported animal research, and said, what are the top performing institutions for those units of assessment? And there are five, top five. Uh, and Oxford's one of these, you'll be delighted to hear, as is Cambridge. And Edinburgh is one of these top five, which is fantastic. They're color coded to protect my future career prospects. It's a lovely Scottish blue color here. And we found over a thousand publications from those institutions published in the two years following RAE 2008, when they should have been at the top of their game. So how did they perform against those Landis criteria? The answer is not very well. Less than 15% reporting randomization, less than 20% reporting blinding, 10% for inclusion and exclusion criteria, 2% reporting sample size calculations. 68% of those publications did not report a single one of those items. And only one publication out of a thousand from Oxford, uh, as it happens, from Alistair Buchan, reported all four of those things. So a long, 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 long way to go. So what could we do? Well, you could try getting publishers to, uh, to raise their game and uh, Nature changed their uh, guidance for authors. And we did a study with Nature looking at papers from Nature before and after that change in editorial policy. In here, the black bars is that the study reported randomization. The hatched bars is that they fess up and they say, we did not randomize. So this is nature before and after. And for each article, we matched it with uh, 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 PubMed related citations with a, with a non-nature journal. And you can see that this had a substantial uptick for randomization, for blinding, for power calculations, and for reporting exclusions that was not seen in the non-nature journals. And that compliance, which had been one out of 1,000 uh, in that UK data set, went up to 16%. So it has an effect, but it was really, really hard work for nature. Uh, because essentially what they ended up doing was, was demanding it in revision six, that if the authors didn't say about something about randomization, they would write in the manuscript that it wasn't randomized and wait for the authors to scream. And sometimes they did, and sometimes they didn't. There's another set of guidelines uh, for reporting animal research, the ARRIVE guidelines, which are more specific. And there'd been a bit of chat about these when they'd first come out in 2010 about journals adopting them. And over a thousand journals had adopted the ARRIVE checklist. But when David Baker and others went to find out whether it made a difference, he thought that it didn't. And then there was a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth saying that the journal should just do a better job of getting people to complete a checklist because then everything would be fine. And again, we thought that was a tractable and interesting hypothesis. So we took manuscripts submitted with, with the help of PLOS One, we got inside their manuscript handling uh, engine. So manuscripts submitted to PLOS One were randomized to either normal handling, which is our policy is that we want you to be RI compliant, please send us a checklist, or enhanced handling, which was uh, that they said, until we get your checklist, your manuscript's going nowhere, mate. So send us a checklist. And then we followed these through uh, to publication. And, and I should say that no one in at PLOS, apart from that first doorstep receipt of manuscript, actually knew that there was a study going on. We got ethical approval for that slight subterfuge. Uh, we randomized over 1,600 papers. Uh, about 300 in each group were accepted for publication. The checklist had been completed in about 3% of the cases where we'd asked nicely for it, in about 90% where we demanded it. So there are still authors as old as I am phoning out the editorial desk saying, what are you doing? Ra ra ra. Why can't you just get on and send my manuscript out for review? What difference did it make to compliance with the ARRIVE guidelines? It made no uh, difference at all because none of them in either cohort were. So simply uh, telling scientists what to do doesn't work. Who, who, who would have thought it? Now, there's another little dimension here. I said I was talking mostly about animals, but I think in vitro research is also critical. And you heard a little bit about some of the problems with reproducibility there before. In that nature study that I told you about, we looked at in vitro research as well as in vivo research. So here's the performance for in vitro research about randomization and blinding uh, and inclusions and whatever. So, and, and the I suppose the most representative group here is the non-nature papers. Uh, so these are the most not most recent papers that didn't get into nature. So 
Uh, overall, for randomization, about 3% told you something useful about it. About 2% uh, told you something useful about blinding, a bit more about exclusions and hardly anything in terms of a power calculation. So this is very bad. And we need to do better. And so recently, uh, with colleagues in various publishing houses, we've published the uh, materials design analysis reporting framework for transparent reporting across the life sciences, so not just animal research, but human experimental research, in vitro research and the like. And the PLOS guidelines have been, so the, the ARRIVE guidelines have been updated as of last year. Uh, and importantly, while everything in the ARRIVE guidelines is important and critically important, clearly people were having a, a problem being almost caught in the headlights of all these different things that they had to do. So we've prioritized the 10 things which are really most critical for earliest intervention. Now, I think we also need to consider uh, uh, where researchers are. And I don't think that all researchers are, are very bad, and I don't think that all researchers are excellent. I think we sit on a spectrum, and you can define this spectrum by things that we know are uh, appalling, like falsification and fabrication and plagiarism through hypothesizing after results are known, making your hypothesis fit the data rather than the other way around, and uh, doing experiments at high risks of bias. Uh, and then better things like commitment to open science and finally uh, pre-registration of study designs in a public domain so people can check your working and your intention. And the problem with what we've done in the past, I think, is we've focused on that extreme end of the spectrum. We've tried to identify these people, get them to pack their belongings in a cardboard box and march them from the building, pausing only to collect their library cards, telling them never to darken our door again. Uh, and that means that for the vast majority of science uh, scientists, uh, research integrity is something that doesn't concern them, it concerns other people. And I don't think that's helpful because with this distribution, uh, you could either try and do this, but even if you get rid of the most egregious 30% of research practices de defining that end, you get the same benefit as if everyone were to improve only by one or 2%. And so there's different strategy of research improvement, which is, not, account, not about accountability, it's systems focused rather than individually focused. We recognize fallibility rather than having this academic perfection myth, recognize the value and, and, and celebrate the value of teamwork, value local peer review, and really critically as in healthcare improvement, we see shortcomings as something that we found out that helps us learn to improve rather than something that we should all talk about in hushed voices around the water cooler uh, and, and be terribly embarrassed about. So how might you go about research improvement in the context of in vivo research? Well, to improve, you need to measure. And this is our preprint, I think, from last week or early this week, uh, where uh, Sheng Ying, who's one of our PhD students funded partly by John Climax UKRN PhD studentship and partly by the Chinese Scholarship Council, has developed an automated uh, natural language processing tool that will take the full text of animal research and tell you whether or not it's randomized or blinded. So it can cope with hundreds of thousands of, of articles to give you some sort of audit here. So here's our performance in the F1 scores and um, for uh, identifying randomization with good recall and precision blinding. Not very good at identifying animals excluded from analysis, but we found our human screeners were poor at this as well. And then with that, you can take that to run an audit of reporting standards for journal and funder and, inst and institution. And this is our our protocol for this now up in, in, in the public domain. And in fact, we've submitted this and it's under review with PLOS Biology as our registered report so that if and when the findings when the findings come out, we can show that we did what we set up to do, out to do rather than set out to, to pick a fight. But, but looking and what, what might this look like in terms of a, a, an audit system? Well, taking the regular expression, which is our previous tool here, so with, with the caveats of that, it means that you can look at 130,000 publications by funder at their average reporting of randomization and blinding. Teal here are the US funders who take up most of the in, in vivo work that we could find in PubMed Center, at least in INDS that's done so much to promote this. This is the median score here. Uh, and if you look uh, here, at, uh, so this is the performance over the over the years from uh, uh, 2011 to 2018. This is the improvement over that period. The dot is how much work each of those funders uh, is, is responsible for. So NINDS is both improving and uh, performing well. And here are our UK funders. 
and it's disappointing to see that the, the, the performance of UK research is lagging behind what is predominantly an American literature. Uh, but it's, it's good to see, this is MRC and welcome, it's good to see that we do seem to be improving at a faster rate than most. And of course, what's good for the goose, and you can do this for institutions. So these are UK institutions who've published more than 100 papers. The dot size is the amount of work they've published. This is their performance over the period, and this is their improvement over the period. So if you're up in here, that's good because you're performing well and you're improving. If you're down here, you're neither performing very well or improving very much. And, and of course, there's no secret about this. Anyone can take our code and run it. So I might as well tell you the answers. Uh, the fastest improving institution in the UK is the University of Aberdeen, the best performing institution in the UK on this combined outcome for randomization and blinding is the University of Nottingham. Edinburgh is doing a good imitation of, of uh, Jupiter with its rings here. Uh, and here are uh, uh, some of your institutions. So you can look at uh, the performance for blinding and randomization by institution, and you can look at the rate of improvement by institution. Now, the, 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 these tables, I, I, I don't call them league tables because they're about improvement, not accountability, but they paint a very different picture of where research and re research improvement is going well than the picture that you also get, that you often get, for instance, from some of the more conventional university ranking systems. And so this is our model. Uh, this is published last year in Patterns uh, from the UK Reproducibility Network Steering Group with the idea that a community asserts what constitutes best practice. And for instance, that's what we're doing in Equipped. Doing that on the basis of reporting guidelines or research on research or expert opinion or the demands of research users, we then measure that performance in the ways that I've shown you. And then we have training and incentives and interventions to try and shift that performance led by scientists, most of whom should at least have some foundation skills and improvement. Uh, some having field specific skills in, in, in improvement, and we've got some people with field specific skills trying to improve our in vitro research in Edinburgh, and some people with black belt improvement skills who, who've got general skills across a range of research epistemologies, and then measure the performance again, reviewing per your performance and celebrating your success and raising your ambitions, and then continually trying to turn this cycle so we can continually try and get better. And I would argue that that's a much more sensible, engaging, practical and pragmatic approach to trying to improve the way we do research rather than trying to hunt down the guilty and expel them from our communities. I'd like to thank all the people uh, that have been involved uh, with this work, our funders, uh, and uh, thank you again for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Malcolm, and, and all our, our speakers. Um, we now have a, a, a period of time for, um, for, for questions, and I, I've got quite a number that have, have come in. But I think, I think there is a, a common theme um, here, which is that um, actually the expected standards and, and best practice are actually relatively well described now, um, uh, both for sort of preclinical and, and in vivo work. W one of the issues here is that we're not following them. And um, I guess there's, whenever, whenever one's faced with that sort of question is, what's the issue? Is it a carrot or a stick type um, a problem? And you, you, Malcolm, have suggested some, some um, approaches to do that. But I, I wonder if we could reflect for a moment is um, how strong is the evidence base that actually, if you follow these best practice guidelines, you have a better quality product? Have we, have we really convinced the community that um, this isn't just another sort of piece of, of, of let's call it mindless policing that is that is being undertaken here. So Malcolm, I'll, I'll let you reflect on that and, and then Martin and Tim, I'll come to you. So, so it's an interesting question. Of course, ideally what we would want to do is to, is to take drugs at inception and randomize them to standard development or you know, enhanced development and, and see what works. I would, I would take, uh, I, I would say a couple of things because that's not gonna happen and I, I don't think. Uh, I'd hate to try and do that power calculation. Um, 
A couple of things. Uh, one is when you look in systematic review, high quality studies tend to be more aligned with the results of clinical trials. That's to say, the, 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 there's, a, the, there's a part of the animal data which is neutral, and that tends to be the higher quality animal data, and that tends to align with clinical trial findings. Um, where you've got a drug which clearly does work in humans like TPA, uh, the animal findings turn out to be robust even in systematic review, even when controlling for high quality research. Um, so that's one bit of it. The second bit of it, I would say, though, is that if you were to have this conversation with a Scandinavian neuropharmacologist from 1960, they'd look at you like you're crazy. Because this is thing, the, the, these sort of things are things that are forebear generations. It was just part of their bread and butter. This, this was how you did research. And, we, and we've drifted away from that because it's too expensive or it's too difficult or, or, or whatever. Uh, you know, the costs of doing it well are actually fairly trivially small. Uh, uh, and, and it's just a question of doing things slightly differently. Now, in terms of the, the, the motivations and the drive, I think I think carrots much better than state. But for instance, one of the things that we're doing in Equipped is working with some of the scientific brokerage uh, agencies like scientists.com and science exchange is is uh, developing and enabling a self-assessment tool against some of these issues which their providers can use and then post the results on the scientist.com website so someone coming in there looking for a provider of, of research can see well th well these people have got this uh, 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 set of research standards and these people uh, haven't looked or don't have it and that provides a a carrot to help people uh, move forward rather than rather than a stick. And I think that's the way to do it. Thank you. Martin. So I would I was slightly kind of balance kind of the, the view by saying I believe that we do have certain best practices that could certainly be applied, though best practices are not the same thing as standards. And especially kind of in the early phase of discovery, we still do not really have many standards available. So for example, for clinical trials in oncology, the RESIST criteria are commonly applied and everybody uses RESIST. We don't have an equivalent in the discovery stage as of now. So I think there still is kind of a lot of work that is going on in actually developing those standards as something which can guide, which can guide kind of work for many researchers. And independent of that, but linked to it, obviously, would be the question of best practices. And that is something we believe kind of we, we should be able to make more progress. But it is something which I believe is very much <clears throat> a question of culture change, where organizations such as UKRN, I think, are playing a very important role in being a grassroots initiative of primarily kind of PhD level and postdoc level scientists who want to work towards using better practices to make sure their research actually is reproducible. Thank you. Tim, did you have any additional reflections? You're on mute. Sorry, I, th I think a lot of it's to do with the culture in which we work. Um, I think the elements of training that are done both for uh, specific scientific activities and those that are related to clinical trials are well established and known. Um, and I think it's cultural, the problem with uh, what I describe as poor studies. And I think that cultural issue is a very important aspect. It's simply that uh, the reward system we have in society does not necessarily promote those that spend their time doing things properly. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a real challenge. And I think, um, the uh, quick fix on an issue that's cropping up in a clinical trial may well be quite inappropriate, um, and that's done not uncommonly. So I think the, the element here is cultural, and it is building um, a, a level of competency and a belief in that competency in its value in producing the benefits that you're looking for in terms of the new therapies. Um, I'd sort of isolate that part of my reply and just add in one further element to it. There is an enormous element of chance, I think, in undertaking work that is complex. Um, quite a lot of it is to do with collective 
interactions with people who are working in association with that piece of research. And that collaborative interaction very often provides the criticisms and comments and what I describe as challenges that are necessary to get things on track. Um, it's quite difficult in big and small companies to get the right mix of people to work in these sort of settings, particularly at the critical stages of a medicine's development. And in the preclinical stages, I think this is particularly important, but it also applies for clinical, clinical studies and also providing a group sense of response to things when a study goes wrong. Um, a lot of studies do break down in practical terms, but they're often easy to solve, provided there is quite a lot of important thought. So cultural reward systems, but also working in groups and trying to get the groups well uh, mixing in terms of exchange of ideas and working together. Thank you, Tim. I wonder if I could just have a, a follow up question that's come through, which is, um, to, to what extent does the marketplace and competition here between commercial entities as opposed to academic um, uh, entities either improve or 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 feed this this um, this process, Malcolm? I don't know whether in in your work you distinguished between uh, investigators that were working in an academic context as opposed to a, a commercial one, or whether you had any views on that. So a couple of things. And many uh, years ago, we tried to draw that distinction. Uh, and the, 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 the context which seemed to be most susceptible to bias was where an academic lab was doing contract work for a company. So the company's internal work was fine. The academic lab's work that it was doing in pursuit of its own scientific interest was not bad. Uh, uh, but the work that the academic lab was doing to pay for the lab techs when there were between grants was the stuff that was. Uh, and, and one of my erstwhile colleagues uh, spent some time on, uh, not in this country, uh, took a company drug and they paid him to work out how good it was for stroke. And, and after a while, he said, no, when I do these experiments properly, there's nothing here. And they said, thank you very much. That You've saved us a fortune. We'll be sure to come back to you. And they've been coming back to him every six months uh, in the years leading up to that. They have never darkened his door again because he shot their folks and they didn't like the idea. And in fact, having sat on some uh, external advisory boards in relation to investments in companies, uh, pro, pro bono, I should say, uh, I've seen some uh, instances where I've been really unconvinced by the data, but a drug, but one of the larger drug companies has wanted to come in and buy out the company on the basis of really not very good data. And it turns out, I think, that the rationale for that was that another company had developed a, a product development in that space. They didn't have something in that space and they wanted to be able to show their shareholders that, that they weren't getting left behind. And the benefits to them in terms of sustaining their share price because of what was in their pipeline was greater than the risk of loss of the drug being a turkey when they eventually got it, it, it to see whether they got it to the end of the pipeline. And I think that's a thing. If you look at what happened to the after share price when NH5 fell over, quite a lot of the market capitalization of a drug company is based on presumed future earnings. And to have presumed future earnings, you have to have a pipeline. And if I was able to take my systematic review tools and help all these companies out by saying that everything in the pipeline was, was going to be a turkey, and they should invest in something else, they, they wouldn't thank me because their market capitalization would fall quite substantially. So there's a bit of, there's a bit of, let's like, just keep dancing and don't let the music stop going on here, I think. Martin, from, from your perspective, you know, um, I, I, is there a, a tension or a pressure, as it were, from um, uh, people who place work in, the, in, in your space uh, around, uh, around, you know, as you say, getting the right result. I mean, to be fair, kind of, unfortunately, I think kind of we, there are always instances when people, of course, kind of have, an, have a specific interest in certain results looking a certain way. Whether it's for an academic publication or for a presentation that is supposed to convince investors, 
I think there's there's always going to be interests where people have either a conscious or a subconscious bias that they want data to look a certain way. And that is why I think it's so important that we think about data quality in a very holistic way, that we do make sure the data is actually robust and it provides a very clear yes or no answer. Um, because once, re once results are less ambiguous, it is much easier to say there is something there or there isn't something there. Ambiguous results are really kind of the worst thing that can happen or inconsistent results where something appears to work on Mondays but doesn't work on Tuesdays, that's always kind of very bad, be it academic or, or industrial research. So I think that is also one of the reasons why we know that more and more investors in biotech companies require third-party validation before they invest in a company. Because they just don't want to run into the risk of, an, of a laboratory being the only people who can reproduce their own results. Instead, they then give it to kind of a third party and say, kind of, please reproduce the results. And if everything kind of matches up, then we can proceed with the investment. And that seems to be, at least for the East Coast, that's by now actually more or less standard procedure. Thank you. We talked a little bit about um, uh, about you know some of the, some of the sticks and things, but I, I wonder is do you see a role for the regulator here in terms of um, at the point that a com a sponsor is submitting a dossier for a CTA? Um, Dun Duncan, before yeah. before we get into that, could yeah. I just comment a yeah, bit sure. about the industry side? Um, I've I've killed off a number of dogs in my career as a pharmaceutical physician, um, all of which have had what I describe as uh, interesting potential, but failed at a particular point in their development. Um, it is very hard for a company to walk away. There is no doubt about that. But the reality of it is you gain from walking away. A dog is a dog. It's not uh, what I describe as a winner. And it, the practical details of killing off products early is one that senior management, if it's doing its job, will do. Um, so I don't think, uh, I'm not sort of casting aspersions on people's quality in industry, but I'm just saying that companies that don't have good management have a problem and they have a problem with a whole range of things, not just simply the validity of, validity of their data. So I think this is a management issue within companies. And I would, I would say that all the dogs that I've knocked out, basically something's come out of it that's really been quite important. Um, and you know, developing new tools for assessing issues in terms of toxicity have come out of it, which have been extraordinarily helpful in creating a completely novel approach and being able to select uh, new molecules that do not have the problem. All of this comes about by having the courage of knocking things out. And I think the reality is um, there's always a quick buck to be made <laughs> by getting the share prices up or down. But quite honestly, if you do not reproducibly produce medicines that work, your company is dead. And I think this comes down to good management. And it varies. One company's management is fantastic for a few years and then it changes. So I think, I think the reality here is it comes down to good management. They can't actually let their, what I describe as investors down, their shareholders down by just simply fixing the books. It just doesn't work. And it has a governance issue associated with it and it's a quality issue in terms of the management. Thanks, Tim, for that very helpful insight. So uh, I guess we've heard a fair bit around um, publication because that's that's one important incentive for, um, uh, for, for particularly academic researchers. Um, but I guess where I was going was we've, we've got these minimum standards, as has been mentioned, and there have been, it is... Is there a role for the regulator at that point of submission to say, actually, the data you've submitting is not meeting those minimum standards? And actually, until you can meet those standards, um, I'm not going to give you a, a CTA to, to move forward with your with your 
production with your with your molecule or is or is that going too far uh, i'd be interested um in in thoughts on that why don't we start with you tim well uh, malcolm's put his hand up but <laughs> but I'll, I'll very i'll be very quick and brief um i would say working with the agencies is critically important uh, they provide a particular view on the product and it is often in a particular context um, their advice i think is often invaluable and they do that job the fda in particular but also um, uh, the uh, uh, paul ehrlich institute for biologics in uh, the EMA, they're very, very careful in terms of giving you guidance and they will change you from what you've produced in terms of a study design. And I could tell you one very good story of this. I was, I was asked to increase the dose of a vaccine. So I said, by how much? And I was told by the assessor, double it or quadruple it. We actually put the dose up by sevenfold and it doubled the efficacy of the vaccine. And the point is, we would never have done that without their advice. You know, it was going quite against the trend at the time, and that advice was invaluable. So I think the agencies already have that sort of role, and they are not, if you like, forbidden for criticizing the sponsor in terms of the scientific content of their submission. Thank you, Malcolm. So the so this is partly with drawing on from my experience at CHM, and and particularly with the COVID vaccines, we've had a, a slightly different approach to approvals, which have been rolling approvals, and clearly there have been a lot of uh, iterative interactions between the companies developing the vaccines and the regulators, which I think has been very very helpful in in uh, in that context. The assessment team, certainly at the agency, are, are absolutely, you know, as individuals, they're absolutely fantastic in being able to drill down into what's going on uh, and, and what, the, if you like, the dossier-based evidence is. But in contrast to regulating for marketing authorizations, where we are very keen to look at the uh, rigor and robustness of the clinical trial data, when we are, and there are very few clinical trial authorizations come to the commission, but when they do, we're much more interested in the risks to human participants. And we sure. tend to take the view that if a company is, is convinced enough that this is worth trying, that they're sinking all this money into it, we are not gonna second guess their, uh, their uh, claims of potential efficacy, which is where I think a lot of the difficulty is. We're just gonna be all over their safety data like a rash, particularly when it's biologics, uh, you know, given our experience with Tudeno and others, uh, or, uh, vaccine challenge or COVID challenge trials or the like, the, the main thing in clinical trial authorizations is the safety signal and, and having confidence in that. Or if you don't have confidence, having staged your dose escalation or whatever with, with appropriate pauses in between es escalations so that you know if you've got problems before they become uh, too apparent. Thank you. Martin, I mean, I highlighted in my talk how actually the preclinical data often underpins decisions, particularly in first into humans uh, around this. Would you be keen to say, I mean, and you've highlighted a number of the sort of inter-agency and inter-company collaborations that there are to try to improve quality, but, uh, you know, that's all optional at the moment. Would you like to see that moving towards um, being something that was more baked in from a regulatory expectation point of view? Mm. I think before kind of a compound reaches humans, at least kind of in the American context, there is kind of an IND there is kind of an IND kind of filing or submission. So there is a, a process in place, which means that a lot of data has to be produced that shows the drug to the best of our knowledge, best of our abilities, should be safe to use in humans. And then we do the phase one trial to confirm that it's safe to use in humans. I personally believe that we should look at data kind of starting earlier than that, because as we've seen in the example I shared from science translation, translational medicine, we might have compounds going through animal studies and going into clinical trials, which work on completely different targets to what we think they do. And this is something which a CRISPR, simple CRISPR experiment could have elucidated that. So something which would have been very simple and very cheap to run could have told us that information three years before when it was then detected 
um, in, in the end. So I believe that it would make sense to think about data standards and data structure and data governance earlier. I believe we just need to strike kind of a very careful balance between innovation on the one hand and um, too much regulation on the other. It always has to be a balance because we know that tightening of regulation can prolong processes. And we know that we do need new therapies now, not in 20 years. So I think it's going to be a balance that we need to be struck. But I think if we were to move towards better data, data, better data standards, that would be kind of a very good basis because better data means less ambiguity, means clearer and faster decisions, which is in everybody's interest. Thank you. So we've spent most of our time talking about the assays that we're actually doing at the moment. But one of the critical questions is, are we actually using the right assays and are they actually telling us um, anything uh, useful? Martin, I wonder if I could start with you by just asking, you know, what are the incentives and, and drivers in this process around innovating in terms of the, the, the content and the nature of assays in order to make them um, potentially more, more translational than, the, than they might be at the moment. I think we always need to bear in mind that any essay system we use, any model, is always going to be a very incomplete reflection of the incredibly complex human physiology. There's never going to be a way to completely replicate that in an in vitro or an in vivo setting two-dimensional cell culture is not a very natural assay system to use. Isolated proteins is not very natural. Doing experiments in mice without an immune system is also not very natural. None of these things are fully reflective of biology in humans, but they are kind of the best techniques we have. And of course, there is always a trend towards improving them. And for example, organoids, 3D cell culture, and other techniques can be a very interesting way to reduce the amount of number of animals used in research, which I think is a good thing. We're trying to reduce that. And is also a way to try to bring a greater degree of physiological relevance into the research process. But we always need to bear in mind, all of those are just approximations, what in the end only clinical trials can tell us. Thank you. Malcolm, I hesitate to ask this question of you because the, the, the translational value of animal models is a sort of, uh, you know, three year symposium on its its own. But I, I'd just be interested from your perspective is, you know, what are the incentives and drivers actually for people to try and come up with, you know, um, I, I suppose, more informative models rather than. Um, yeah, well, well, actually, I think the BBSRC are just looking at, at this and have surveyed their their fundees um, to see what their views are. And and I, my understanding is the gist of that is that people feel that there's not enough funding available or time available or expertise available to really consolidate models. And and one of my concerns is is you know as with Maslow's hammer people use, uh, use the model that they have established in the lab to answer whatever their current research question is, no matter how well. Now, I, I shudder to think how many models we've been using for years have suddenly become very good models of COVID uh, and therefore can get into COVID funding streams. Actually, you, and it's a, it's a bit, uh, uh, it's not a very popular view, but, uh, particularly when it comes to animal behavior and neurobehavior, particularly in the context of the diseases which are so difficult to treat, by which I mean the dementias, the psychoses, the depressions. There's so many different behavioral outcomes and we don't know enough about them. We don't know how they perform differently in different species or different circumstances, but yet there are at least 100,000 publications describing primary animal research with behavioral, uh, with behavioral outputs. So why don't we take a big data approach to those and say, well, these are the different, these are the, these are the different uh, principal components of animal behaviors that are sampled by these different tests. And so these are the ones that you want to look at because the data are there to be able to do that. That was when Kieran Egan, who was a PhD student with me, looked at drugs that had been tested in the Morris water maze in transgenic models of Alzheimer's disease. And he found that there were more ways of interpreting the Morris water maze findings than there were publications describing a Morris water maze output. And so, you know, and there can't be a good reason for that. And the reason is either habit or 
uh, you know, get, getting the best p value out of your data. But but it would be possible to take a, almost a, like a a, a, a bio curation, bioinformatics approach to behavioral outcomes and, and describe the, the, the rodent behaviorome and, and how that was sampled by different outcome measures. And that, you know, and that would, because that, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't feel at all confident uh, developing a drug for those conditions, for my conditions, on the basis of in vitro work followed by human clinical trials. I mean, I, I think that's so far away that it's, you know, organized or not. Or, or tissue on a chip, I think that's miles away. I wonder, Tim, if I could ask you a, a related but but slightly different question, which is, you know, this is a complex area and, and we're hearing from experts who are living it ev every day. Um, as people like you and I, in some ways, the customers of these of these data and, and have to make decisions um, uh, on on them, how can we ensure that clinicians who are working in this space are, you know, up to date with, you know, really what the what the current standards are um, and, and the expectations should be on an ongoing basis? Because it's clearly, it, it's a field that's evolving uh, quite rapidly, but isn't necessarily um, one that um, clinicians working in the area are going to have their uh, their finger on if uh, unless they make it part of their business to do so now you, you've just touched upon um, an area that we we have a great interest in developing what i describe as a series of uh, conversations that would focus upon this particular area I, I think this is to do with education actually duncan and i think the the elements here are how how can you get the uh information packaged in such a way that people who are involved in this can get it easily and simply. Um, there is, as, as Malcolm says, an enormous number of different uh, models being created. COVID is a lovely example for this, and quite a number of them are quite useful in terms of defining mechanisms that could be related to man. But to get that quickly and to get an, a, a sense of what is real and what is not real is quite difficult. I think this is an educational aspect and it's something that should be invested in, uh, particularly when um, you're looking at a complex disease like dementia and trying to come up with what I describe as a, a radically different therapeutic for it. So I think um, we need to give a lot more thought on the educational side as to how to keep people up to date and how to do the digging necessary to find out which is a good model and which is not. And I think this is changing so rapidly, people have to get, uh, how can I say, a cultural change in how they work. Thank you. And I, I think that's a, a very good point on which uh, I think we can finish. I, I very much uh, like to thank all of our speakers for your um, excellent talks, but also um, for your very insightful uh, comments in the in the discussion. Um, I'd very much like to thank the audience for uh, their participation and the large number of questions that uh, that have come through. I'm a, sorry we haven't managed to get um, uh, um, uh, get through all of. Them, but I hope that we have uh, managed to touch on uh, many of the themes that you have raised through your various um, questions. As I say, um, this is uh, a series that we continue uh, at St Hilda's on, on a roughly termly basis. And uh, um, I hope that uh, if you have found this interesting, that uh, you will return um, uh, to uh, future seminars. And uh, uh, with that, I'd like to thank everyone involved and uh, wish you a, a good evening. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much.